The Tom Woods Show, episode 1209. Prepare to set fire to the index card of allowable opinion. Your daily dose of liberty education starts here. The Tom Woods Show. Folks, if you've ever considered starting your own podcast or self-publishing a book or just earning affiliate commissions the way all the cool kids do online or starting an online business, I've got step-by-step instructions on how to do all these things because, well, frankly, I've done all these things. Get your copy of my free ebook on all this at pathstoincome.com. Hi, everybody. Tom Woods here, still broadcasting from New York. You may still hear some sounds of the city in the background. Talking to Scott Pulsifer today, who is president of Western Governors University, the nation's first and largest competency-based university. I'm going to let him talk to you about what makes the place unique. It's interesting that the inspector general of the Department of Education has been giving them a hard time. Of course, the inspector general of the Department of Education is probably caught in you know, the year 1927 when it comes to higher education and what's possible and what ought to be done. But anyway, it's a very interesting story of, of, I think, rather a meritorious institution that may in fact help some of the folks listening to our conversation here today. Scott, welcome to the show. Thank you so much for having me, Tom. I decided to pursue this topic on a listener recommendation, and I'm very interested in what you're doing at uh, Western Governors University. There's one aspect of it before we get into much further. In the old days, and I mean old days, the creation of the university system in Western civilization, maybe the early 13th century, if not earlier, there wasn't so much of a sense that in order to satisfy the requirements to get the degree, you have to show that you've done this, this, and this. It was more a question of, do you have the knowledge? And if you have the knowledge, we'll give you the certification. Is there some extent to which Western Governors University is pursuing that way of looking at education? You know, I think there is. Uh, And and you're right, you know, in terms of the history of of higher education, if you will, it, it was very much about demonstrating a proficiency in whatever the particular topic or domain was. And and uh, that that kind of core assumption or that core uh, design element is actually at the root of WGU it, in the sense that uh, we are a competency-based designed uh, model for education is that the, uh, the, the model actually focuses on measuring learning and not necessarily time spent learning. Um, and it just uh, takes into consideration that different individuals will learn at different paces and they will learn in different ways. And but uh, regardless of that, uh, as an individual demonstrates proficiency, then they effectively have earned the credit, if you will, and that will advance ultimately to the credential that they are pursuing. So yes, at the root of WGU in the competency-based design model is demonstration of knowledge and proficiency. Now, some of that, I think, follows from, or at the very least, very much caters to the kind of people who are enrolling, where you have people who have some college in a lot of cases, they have some college experience, but they don't have a degree. And you're able to tailor a program to them that minimizes the extent to which they have to go over things they've already done. Yeah, in fact, if you go back to the founding of Western Governors University, when the uh, you know governors of 19 Western states really uh, were convening or you know centering on this idea of establishing a new model of a institution of higher education, uh, they specifically were innovating or at least uh, you know formulating ways in which they could specifically address the needs of the adults that had some college and no degree. Um, And often uh, they had specifically also tried to address the underserved population in their respective states. By that really underserved from the standpoint of education meant, you know, for whom uh, is the current model or the more conventional model of higher education system, uh, for whom is it not very accessible, not very affordable, uh, and uh, not not very uh, not very well designed to the needs and of these particular adults. And I think what you'll find is that these adults have some college and no degree. They have a variety of different needs. Uh, for example, seventy uh, percent of our students are working full time. Seventy percent of our students also have families um, that, for a variety of reasons, they do not have the time, nor are they necessarily geographically proximal to. A campus, uh, they don't necessarily have the uh, means or the or the uh, financial uh, situation to be able to afford uh, attending a traditional college. And so, when you design for these individuals, um, you have to think differently. And 
One of the uh, expectations is, is that while they may have had some college and no degree, the reality is that they have a lot of learning. And a competency-based model also accepts the fact that they may have advanced their learning and proficiency in a variety of different domains through experience. And so that allows that to happen. Whereas you compare that to a traditional college, you know, it is primarily designed around the first time full-time student, you know, the high school graduate who is not yet experienced college level learning and the demands that that places on the individual and the, you know, the, the, you know, academic learning behaviors that they have to develop and, and master so that they can advance at a college level. That's a very different, uh, you know, population of adults than who WGU is serving. And, and it is true today, just to uh, even make it clear, I think fully 95 plus percent of our students fit into that category that have had some college and no degree. All right. So now that I, for some reason, I started off with super specific things instead of the usual bird's eye overview. You're trying to make the case for Western Governors University to somebody who is, uh, let's say, just has more or less imbibed nothing but the traditional model. How do you make that case? And Let's start with the affordability aspect also. What's the tuition like? What's it been like over the past, let's say, 10 years? A uh, question like that. And then what's the benefit to WGU to me? Yeah, I think uh, if you looked at the hallmarks of Western Governors University and what really makes it different, it, it, uh, it actually begins with even the design of the academic model itself. And, and if you consider, you know, if you're, if you're a learner, an adult who, uh, who needs to pursue higher education to really access new opportunities in one's life, then here's some of the elements that are, uh, that are particularly differentiated at WGO. Uh, you know, first and foremost, we do focus on uh, improving the quality and relevancy of the academic programs. You will not see WGU offering 200 plus programs in a whole variety of different fields. We try to ensure that the learning outcomes of our programs are more linked or mapping to the competencies that are needed in the workforce. We have four colleges focusing on business, health professions, teacher education or teacher preparation, if you will, and information technology. Um, in those four colleges, we have a roughly 65 uh, bachelor's and master's programs. We do offer bachelor's and master's programs only today. Um, and when a student matriculates to WGU, they have to uh, matriculate into a program from the start. Uh, it is very purposeful in that design because that establishes a very clear plan and goals and outcomes that uh, we can really help a student progress to. The other thing is you consider the design is that competency-based model that it uh, it accepts the fact that while there's a minimum pace that you as an individual student can move at the pace that is right for you and if that is an accelerated pace then a competency-based model uh, does not constrain your pace of learning and the last piece i would say is that we've in this academic design is the faculty model that we have because everything we do at wgu is centered on the students that we serve we somewhat unbundled the traditional faculty role and we have you know, four different faculty types, three of which are directly student facing. And those are our faculty mentors, we call them program mentors. These are you know, credentialed faculty that masters and above within the program field of study. And this faculty mentor you will have from the day you start until the day you graduate. They are there to ensure that you have the right academic plan, the sequencing of programs or courses they ensure that you're ready for your assessments and, and that they also are the individuals who help you deal with the flexibility needed as your life changes and different things can, uh, can get in the way of the, you know, the time needed to, to advance your academic outcomes. That's around the academic design itself. I, oh, separately from the faculty mentors. Sorry, I forgot to finish the other two. We also have course instructors. These are the subject matter experts that you go to when you're in a particular course and you really need that kind of deep expertise around whatever course it may be in the program. And then lastly, we have separately evaluation faculty who are reviewing all of your you know, assessments, your tests. They're, uh, they're providing you all the feedback on your demonstrated uh, you know, learning and areas that you may need to focus on again uh, before you're ultimately able to complete the tests and, uh, and receive the credit for a course. The other key elements that I would note uh, and this is very important, which is we leverage technology to allow us to reach and teach individuals where they are rather than requiring them to uh, come to a campus. We are 100% online. We have no physical campus or classrooms to which students attend. Everything that is done between faculty and students in an individualized way is done on the internet. 
Um, all the courses and learning materials are available in a virtual uh, environment. Even classrooms or, or uh, cohort sessions that are occurring are all occurring uh, virtually online. Uh, and then the other key thing, as you mentioned and asked about, is that, uh, you know, what is the, you know, cost and, and affordability of a degree from WGU? We have what would be considered block term pricing or rather, you know, subscription tuition, meaning that uh, individuals pay a flat rate per six month term. Uh, for that term, it's roughly uh, $3,500 and you can complete as many courses as you are able. Again, like I mentioned, there's a minimum pace, but you can complete as many courses as you are able during that six month term and your tuition does not go up per credit hour or per credit or anything else like that. So uh, as that translates into affordability, um, on average, our, our graduates who complete a bachelor's degree, they will complete that degree in two years and four months. So roughly average cost of $16,000. That's inclusive of all the learning resources and books and materials as well. So that kind of gives you a sense of we've designed the academic model and the, and the curriculum itself to increase its relevancy to the opportunities that our students are pursuing. We've also leveraged the technology and internet available to us today to reach and teach students where they are. And we've also focused on keeping the tuition and cost of attending WGU low so that the investment in their education, they can have a great return on it. And we can talk more about even the outcomes and the graduate outcomes that uh, we believe that are ensuring that the promise of higher education is being realized for our students and graduates. I'm going to ask a question that may sound just like a dumb guy kind of question, but back when I used to teach and they were just starting out with offering online courses as an option at an otherwise traditional university, one of the things that they tested out was having the exams proctored in person, because then that way we can make sure that your best friend isn't doing all your schoolwork for you. Right. How does an online university guard against that? You know, that's a great question, Tom, because uh, one of the things that we believe is a differentiator in how we leverage technology is the ability for us to uh, proctor exams, or if you will, allow students to take their exams in their home or wherever their place of, uh, you know, taking that exam is appropriate allowing us to proctor that virtually. Uh, more than 98% of all the exams that we manage today or proctor today are done so virtually. Uh, we do have the option in some cases for students to go to a physical location if it better serves them. So we had to specifically solve for how do we ensure that uh, the integrity is maintained around a student who's taking that exam. And so one of the unique things that we do, for example, is that we also ship a second uh, video camera to every one of our students. So not are we only using the camera on their laptop or computer, but we also have a second camera that gives us a more uh, complete view of what that student's environment is like. We also leverage a lot of uh, you know machine learning or AI powered software that allows us to truly verify in multiple different ways that the student who's taking the exam is in fact the student. Uh, that includes not only identifying themselves with the photo ID, but it also monitors things like even keystrokes that are based upon you know, observed behaviors, that there's a very clear pattern that's, uh, that allows us to identify that this is the individual taking the assessment as well. And then with that software also monitors everything that's going on while that student is taking the test so that we have a really, really high rate of uh, reliability in ensuring that uh, there is no funny business, if you will, going on while students are taking exams. And that has become a real core strength of ours. I can't remember how many, uh, but how many exams monthly, but if I'm not mistaken, it's, you know, tens of thousands, if not, you know, 30, 40,000 exams are being proctored monthly. Um, and like I mentioned, 98% or more of all of them are proctored virtually. All right, let's move into an area of controversy. And I'm curious to know if you're able to comment. On, I mean, in fact, I read a at least one op-ed you wrote. So I guess you must be at liberty to speak about what the Inspector General of the Department of Education had to say yeah. about uh, about the faculty role at WGU. And I loved your response, but I'm curious to hear uh, hear on the program what you have to say. Yeah, I think um, one, you know, we've always kind of mentioned is that we accept that others may actually not understand the model that we've designed for and, and they're, uh, you know, afforded their opinion and perspective on it. We obviously disagree with that perspective. And uh, I think, you know, at the root of it were a couple key questions. One is uh, of all of our faculty, were all, they, were all those faculty uh, validated not only by us, but our accreditors being credentialed individuals who have 
who have the subject matter expertise for this topic being taught. We think that has been fully validated by our creditor and also the Department of Education, you know, in reviewing the same, that they see that all of our faculty mentors, those that are, you know, that are faculty who have subject matter expertise at the program level, they have master's degrees or higher. Uh, and then all of the course instructors who are subject matter experts at the course level, uh, they are, uh, the large, vast majority of them, 90% plus of them are terminal degree or higher, or you know, I guess you can't be higher, <laughs> terminal degree, um, 90% of them. And so that was one of the core things is, are, do, does our faculty ensure that they have the subject matter expertise that the students rely upon to help their learning and progress? And the other key question is, is whether you then have uh, their substantive and regular engagement with faculty between students. And this is one case where I think not only have we designed for it, but if you observed all of the, uh, the actual interactions that occur between students and faculty, that there, you know, by every indication, you know, there's 90, 100 interactions that are occurring between faculty and students on an individual basis every term. Um, you know, and that the level of engagement and reliance uh, that our students have on their faculty is a direct contributor to the outcomes that our students are achieving in terms of course completion rates, maintaining on-time progress, and ultimately graduating. We recognize that it is a key input to the quality of the model that we've designed. I would also point, uh, you know, your listeners to the Gallup study around uh, Western Governors at uh, University in the sense that our graduates have noted that that it is the perfect fit for them, that they also recognize that they had a faculty who, you know, who encouraged their dreams and aspirations, that, that our, our graduates also are, are achieving outcomes in terms of uh, faculty engagement, based upon their faculty engagement, that they're achieving outcomes that are unmatched by the, you know, by the, you know, typical graduate across the higher ed system. And so we take great satisfaction in knowing that we've done a great job in designing our teaching and faculty and learning model to better align with the needs of our students. Scott, what's your own background? You're not coming from an education background. So what is it and how did you wind up in this position now as president of the university? Yeah, my uh, my background prior to WGU was, uh, you know, nearly 20 years of uh, experience in the technology and software world. Uh, I had... Uh, Previously, I uh, led product and product management for a software startup across the retail and supply chain logistics space, and then had kind of advanced through those ranks, had spent uh, time launching and running a, uh, you know, a business uh, for Amazon. I think what I would say that uh, one thing I've learned through that experience is that there are many sectors, you know, across the environments that I really uh, worked in in technology, whether it was retail, banking, logistics, um, supply chain environments, manufacturing, et cetera, that, that those that were driving innovation, uh, that were advancing the models and designs of how they were going to operate in the future to better serve customers, underpinning all that innovation was, uh, was consistently technology. That the innovation that is really accelerating it uh, today in today's world is supported by the technology that's going to power that. And one of the things that was uh, recognized even in the search for the successor to Bob Mendenhall, who was really our, in many ways, founding uh, president and really grew WGU to achieving what it is today, is that they recognized that uh, the leader of WGU need to have the blend of uh, a true uh, alignment with the purpose and mission of WGU, but also a passion for technology and powering the innovation that is needed when you're approaching uh, higher education completely from a student-centered design. And so that, uh, I think I found that for myself. I would say that uh, I was completely sold on the opportunity when I had the, uh, when I was able to attend a commencement ceremony in Orlando in, in February of 2016. And uh, I've stated it this way, but just to be clear as to what I recognized or saw at that point was that when I saw these graduates walking across that stage and the energy that they had, and then also seeing that not only parents showing up, but children showing up, that to me, it seemed as if the attainment of that credential meant more to them than my degrees did to me. And by that, what I mean is that their struggle to achieve that was far greater than the struggle I believe I had to go through. That there was just this recognition that they had overcome challenges and, and experiences in life 
that uh, this milestone for them was a true uh, success. And not that, that mine weren't a success, but I think it just, uh, it just uh, to me, embodied something about their spirit that just was so inspiring and just drew me into it that I just loved every moment of it. And I just, I just knew then that I wanted to be a part of WGU. And so the combination of just a complete uh, alignment and, uh, you know, a heart and soul into changing the lives of individuals and families is what drew me to WGU. And I'm also then blessed to have an experience where I have seen and been part of uh, leveraging technology to power innovation. And uh, we see that happening at WGU and we see it broadly happening in the higher education system. Are you concerned about the Department of Education taking some kind of action against you? No, not at all. Um, you know, we believe that uh, because of, you know, we've now for over 15 years been accredited by our regional creditor, Northwest Commission. We've long been uh, compliant with the you know, laws and regulations and policies that the Department of Education has worked with us. Um, you know, we, we feel strongly that our opinion and our position on the matters of, you know, faculty credentials and our students' experience and engagement with faculty, that we do believe that our, our ability to individualize the interactions between students and faculty is, is uh, demonstrating a model that has uh, not only advanced the quality of education, but also optimized student outcomes in a manner that, uh, that we, we, we believe that innovation will continue to win and uh, that things will be just fine. So I, I think we'll, uh, we don't expect anything um, negative. Do you guys have a traditional range of majors? Across those four colleges, I, I would say yes. I mean, we do, uh, we across business, health professions, teacher education, and then I, information technology. Within those, I would say you, you would see the typical kind of uh, portfolio of bachelor's and master's programs. So the majors, you know, you're going to see in that, you know, management majors, marketing, you're going to see accounting, et cetera, MBA programs. And then you'll see some specialized MBA programs as well. And then with teacher education, surely elementary education, special education, but also in science and math. In fact, it's notable that our teachers college, I think, graduates more STEM teachers than any other college in the nation. I think we're some 5% of all undergraduate level and 15% of all master's level STEM graduates, teacher graduates. And then within the health professions, by far, our largest program is our nursing from an RN to a bachelor's uh, program, but we also have pre-licensure nursing programs. We also have, uh, you know, nursing education as well as health leadership at the master's level. And then with our information technology, you're surely are going to see computer science and software development and networking, and then also cybersecurity is also a very key and important uh, major area. And uh, all of them are seeing substantial demand and our graduate outcomes are really strong in that regard, meaning that 89% of our graduates are employed full-time in field of study, 95% are employed full-time overall. And they're earning you know, more than $20,000 with a year within just four years of graduation. And when you consider that uh, with just about a fifteen or $16,000 investment, you can see that it's, uh, it's rewarding our, our students uh, well. I seem to recall reading uh, fairly scathing reviews of some so-called for-profit universities, particularly online ones, and uh, saying that this turned out to be not such a good investment for a lot of students. Do you have any opinion on that? Because I know you guys are not for profit, right. but you're private and you're online. And so maybe you're operating under the same cloud of suspicion. We aren't. Um, I would say that uh, the tax status is not necessarily a complete uh, you know, marker of a, a bad actor in higher education. I think that um, there are uh, surely reports and records of those who've offered programs or or credentials and that don't have a great outcome, that the, that the earnings potential of that uh, outcome was nowhere near worth the uh, tuition that was being charged and the cost it took uh, to. So I think that in many ways, the, the regulation and the kind of greater accountability that's uh, now being demanded is, is very welcome. We actually think that from WGU's standpoint, we've prided ourselves on proving that the innovation that we're driving works, uh, and we focus relentlessly on optimizing student success, and we measure it immensely in, in terms of not only the pacing uh, to completing their degree, but also you know, the satisfaction of their experience in doing so, um, the completion rates overall, but we also look a lot at our placement rates, 
our overall well-being of our graduates. We measure as best we can today, uh, income gains, et cetera, uh, because we do believe in the simple notion that uh, innovation that drives outcomes is true innovation. If it doesn't result in the outcomes that are desired, then it's just a bad idea, and you better identify those quickly so you can improve them, address them, et cetera. And so, I think we welcome the greater accountability that's uh, incumbent upon institutions and students to ensure that the investment is driving the outcomes that we desire as a society as a whole when it comes to education. And so the higher bar, I think, has definitely tested many institutions before that may have been driven more by profit than they were by student success. I have to say, I'm, if anything, surprised there aren't more examples of a Western Governors University, given what the internet makes possible and given what the cost savings are by delivering this content over the internet and given the just overwhelming cost of higher education in so many cases, it would seem just like a natural fit to have online universities for a fraction of the cost. And I wonder if the reason we don't see more of it, at least one reason, is that a lot of families are still caught in like a 1982 model where they expect that, why, of course my child is going to go off to college for four years and going to follow the traditional pattern that everybody else follows. And you have to fight against that kind of inertia. Yeah, and to some degree that's true, but I will note that often is not supported by data anymore, meaning that that conventional thinking uh, that you reference, it still is out there. But even today, um, just to give you some reference points, or you give your listeners some reference points. Uh, for example, today, you know, fully a third of individuals that are enrolled in higher education, that's about 20 million adults total. Six million of them today are already taking all or some of their program online. And so that is by far the fastest growing segment of the population that are also enrolling. I think if the latest data um, it was, you know, it was six to seven percent, whereas overall enrollment in traditional model only was flat or declining. The other thing to note is that nearly 40 percent of all of those adults that enrolled in higher education are over the age of 24. And it's also expected that both those taking all or some of their program online, as well as those over the age of 24, that those are the fastest growing population of total uh, adults in the system, that they could each easily reach over 50% uh, within you know, 10, 15, maybe 20 years maximum. And that is the dynamic of higher education today, that, uh, that increasingly uh, the notion of the 18-year-old high school graduate you know, being the only model of higher education, that is, uh, that is changing. And uh, we recognize that even today within WGU, uh, about 90% of our students are over age 24, but uh, 10% or under, and when you consider our size of, you know, roughly 100,000 full-time enrolled students, you know, 10,000 under the age of 24, like that's a pretty large population, our one institution alone that are of uh, more traditional age college, 18 to 24 year olds that are pursuing these avenues to uh, achieve their post-secondary education. The other thing of note is that there are many more options available to adults out there, not just WGU. Uh, we, are very, we are very satisfied and proud of what we've been able to do and drive innovation, but surely you see emerging uh, you know, impact from the large public universities and other private nonprofit universities that are expanding the number of options that are available to adults. And you'll see that even with you know, ASU and uh, you saw Purdue and acquiring Kaplan and establishing Purdue Global is definitely notable. I would, you know, I would say others like Northeastern and Southern New Hampshire and, and uh, you know, that these are institutions or even BYU-Idaho here in our, you know, same neck of the woods down here in, uh, in Utah. You know, they are, there are an increasing number of institutions who are expanding access to high quality programs that are delivered 100% uh, online. What's the website? Our website is www.wgu.edu or just wgu.edu. Easy to get to, easy to remember. Well, I hope people will check it out because I think it is the solution that a lot of folks are looking for, both from a financial standpoint as well as one of convenience and having a program that's more tailored to them than they might be able to get otherwise. As soon as I found out about it, I thought I want to alert folks listening to the existence of this option, which is an option that can be exercised, 
I guess, from anywhere in the world that has an internet connection. It's, uh, I mean, I, I know that these days we're so accustomed to the internet and its miracles that we don't stop to look at what we're surrounded by. I mean, this is, this is really, truly a miracle. I mean, you and I are roughly the same age. And when we were growing up, this would have been like something out of science fiction to us. That's right. I mean, we were only founded 21 years ago, and that you know, it was about a year or maybe two years after the internet itself really began to take root. And uh, it is amazing if you just consider in those two decades how dramatic the change has come about in all aspects of our lives because of the internet. Um, it is uh, it is a very useful tool and can be an amplifier of great things. It, you know, and so I think in this case. Uh, it has been a powering force of helping uh, higher education expand access to so many who need it. Well, I did read somewhere that the education department described themselves as being unlikely to follow up on the inspector general's remarks because they believe that you guys have been doing innovative work and you've been around a long time and they really respect what you're doing. So here's hoping that that is the case and you continue to have uh, tremendous success. So thanks so much for your time. Thank you, Tom. It's a pleasure. All right, folks, hopping on a plane to head back to Florida today, but um, managed to get the episode done. And just to remind you on the general subject of education, the Ron Paul curriculum is where it's at when it comes to homeschooling. And you get special bonuses through me, big, big, big time bonuses that nobody else will give you. So check it out at ronpaulhomeschool.com. It's self-taught. It gets the students a great education while maintaining the mental health of the parents And that's a great combination. So check it out at ronpaulhomeschool.com, and I'll see you next week. Become a smarter libertarian in just 30 minutes a day. Visit tomwoods.com to subscribe to the show for free, and we'll see you next time.